looking at Matthew, and you don't have to open it up, but I'm just going to read a little bit of the story from Matthew 4, um, 18 through 22. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately like they left the boat and their father and followed him. So what I, we're going to talk about tonight is the simplicity of Jesus. That's just kind of what came to me. Um, so as you read that story, as you were listening to it, I want you to kind of think about where you were when Jesus called you. So just think for a moment about where you were. So as these brothers were along the water and Jesus walks by and calls out to them. He says first, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And the other verse says that he called them and immediately they left. Do you remember what it is that he spoke to you when he called you? Does anybody want to share that? Do you guys remember where you were? Do you remember? I had a dream. Okay. I was like, I don't remember how old. Maybe like 11 or 12. And it was more of like a... <laughs> The dream scared me, and so I like, like called out to Jesus, like, kind of out of terror. So like since then, you know, my relationship with Jesus has been, you know, different, more of like a love relationship. But that's how initially. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think because I grew up with the Lord. Okay. You know, my dad's a pastor. Always in the Lord's. So there were specific, I think, seasons of my life where He called different parts of who I am up and out of me. And I can remember some of those things. But the throw down your nets and follow me part of my walk, I don't think ever happened so significantly that I can remember it. Okay. I mean, maybe within the last six months to a year, in a way that I could like categorize feeling a burn beyond like a salvational thing. Okay. Like a relational want to, or like pull. Yeah. I could say this though. I can remember being a teenager and having conversations with the Lord and asking Him to show me my future and what it was that He wanted for me. And He would give me dreams. And when I can remember the morning after, I would wake up from the dream and recall what it was. I remember thinking it was fantastic, but that it was unrealistic for me to have that as my future because it wasn't a career, it wasn't any kind of job that I could see being sustainable. But it was something that was so me and so life and so him and in it together um, that I always remember saying to the Lord, okay, that was awesome, but wait, who am I? What am I supposed to do? And it, it took me from the age of about 15 until I was 19 for me to really realize he was showing me through my 20s, I actually got to do everything that he showed me in the dreams. So when I, when I asked, he was always faithful to show me. It just took me a while to understand what it was that he was showing me and to believe it and to walk it out. I think, um, as I was just getting ready, I'm just thinking about like Jesus and simple. This. So mine was simple. Oh, I don't know. Mine was simple. Mine was the Dalai Lama and an alcoholic were involved in the call for us. And it happened for me and Jen at the same time. 
The Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama. That sounds so simple. <laughs> and an alcoholic. I, I, yeah. So simple. <laughs> Completely. Like kindergarten level right now. Yes. <laughs> yes. So Jen and I had mentioned each other one time, something like, yeah, maybe we should go to church or something. It'd be good for the kids. And, okay, so the Dalai Lama, an alcoholic, and my kids. And, um, and we didn't think much of it. And Jen had an alcoholic acquaintance who was also the realtor that sold us our house. So that's how, that's how we became acquainted with her. And, um, but she, she, would, she would call Jen. She had called her a few times to go or to pick her up at the bar and take her home because she was too drunk to drive. And one time, I'm sorry, this is longer than it was, but it's a really good story. <laughs> one time she called and it was like snowing out and everything else and, and, and this was uh, right at the beginning of February, uh, or I'm sorry, at the end of January. And um, Jen's like, this is it. This is, you know, first of all, she's no, 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 call your husband. She's like, no. And so um, she's like, this is it. This is the last time. So her friend says, thanks for coming to get me. Will you go to church with me tomorrow? <laughs> so okay. Jen's like, okay, yeah, whatever. Um, sure. You call me when you're up and, and, and I'll do that. Well, lo and behold, she called <laughs> like at 8 in the morning. And she didn't probably get her home until like 3 in the morning. And, uh, and so she went. And it was, you know, this incredible experience. So that's where the alcoholic came into play. Um, where the Dalai Lama came into play is I had started back in college again, and it was sort of like a world religion survey type thing. And I was reading a book by the Dalai Lama, and I, the whole interconnected piece, I, I felt that afterwards, I didn't know what it was then, but was really the Holy Spirit saying, yes, there is way more to life than what you comprehend. And so, um, so that's... So simple. <laughs> well, for me, I did not grow up in the church at all. We went, my mom took us to a Presbyterian church off and on as I was growing up. My dad would visit on Easter and Christmas with us. But we were not, I mean, faith was not, not involved in our home at all. So we just were very sporadic. And when I married my husband, he was already part of a denominational church, and actually, when we were engaged, he was in the process of going through the baptism, baptism and, and so forth, so I got to witness him being baptized and really being expressive in his faith before we even got married. So, we were married, we started going to church every Sunday, and I'm in the process of completely just living my own life because you know, I've never had faith very much a part of my life or God. Realizing that there is God, I, I really believe that there was like in this higher power. But all through college, my friends and I, we kind of were just going off like the new age and self-help and you know all those things that you kind of experience a little bit. And I wasn't rooted in anything. So I'm sitting in church and I was asked to be like a teacher of, it was four year old, so I was a honeybee teacher um, for years, and I'm trying to learn of God. Okay, so I'm reading and I'm going to church, trying to learn of Him, and it, nothing was clicking with me. Like there was, it was, everything was flat. Church was flat, relationships were flat that were in church, and reading was just very flat. So I'll be very honest, I got very discouraged and just decided that like this religion thing, I will sit here and I will show up and I will do my part, but I didn't have a relationship because nothing was real for me. So, and that's how I went for years upon years. I kept living my own life, doing my own thing of what I was used to, and just kind of kept going, you know, on from there. So, but for years, that's just how it went until I went to a ladies retreat and kind of showed up and did the same thing, looked the part, did the part underneath and inside, just a really, in that, like a, a real sweet little package of messiness, okay? So I'm sitting in this ladies retreat and 
all I can say is I had an encounter with Jesus where I can relate back to the story of him walking along the water and calling out where he called them. And for the very first time, I heard him call to me. And you know, when you know that Jesus calls to you, I feel like there's something inside of you. There's someone inside of you that really just kind of like sits up nice and straight because he speaks to someone inside. Like I think about the story of Peter and Simon, and when he says, I will make you fishers of men, I believe him just speaking that out rose up something within them that they wanted deep down to be fishers of men. Like that was part of their heart of not just being fishermen and not having good luck, but something within them just kind of rose up to the surface where they were able to immediately follow Jesus because he spoke directly to that person in them. He did the same thing for John and his brother. He called them. And I kind of feel like the Holy Spirit saying, he called them by name. Like he called them in a way that they just immediately left. So for me, when at that ladies retreat, I remember him speaking to me because what, what, what was speaking to me was I'm sitting there at this retreat and I'm hearing and I'm listening to everything that the speaker is really saying, but I'm not really listening to her words because this person is speaking to me. Because the whole time I'm sitting there and I have all these balls in the air, all this stress, all these things that I'm trying to manage and hold on to, and I just felt like this voice kept telling me to come, like he was going to take care of everything that I was concerned with. And I just remember going forward, like physically going forward to the speaker and like kind of falling crazy into her arms, but I didn't like follow him for a couple more weeks. Like I went to him, but I just was really questionable about what this was all about. And so one thing that really attracted me to the person of the Lord was in the midst of those first couple months of me giving him, you know how Mark says, you give him your okay. I think sometimes you can completely like give him a yes. You know, like an okay, like I'm not sure, which I did for a very long time. And then I think you get to a point where you can like, yes, like I'm all in. Um, I really just love the fact that he just wanted me. I feel like that's what really spoke to me was here I was trying to learn about him. My life was a complete mess, like really a complete mess. But he spoke to me in such a way that I didn't feel like he was saying, you have to change to come to me. You have to get it together. I felt like it was a no strings attached type of invitation where I just I just want you for who you are. And I think what really spoke to me is for all my life, I just wanted to be seen. I think that's probably a deep, deep desire in all of our hearts is to be seen and to be known. And I felt like that was a big part of what his invitation was, was I see you just the way you are. Everything that's inside of you, I see and I want. And so I had that encounter. So here all these years, I'm trying to learn about him. And here, for whatever reason, something that I couldn't fabricate on my own, I have this encounter with the person of the Lord at this retreat. And like I said before, um, this is something that he spoke to me and I wrote it down because I am, and if I read from here, it's because I write. I am a diary writer, a writer writer. I just like to process, that's how I think. So he gave, kind of gave me this thought that I did not need to become this whole other person by changing my behavior. But he invited me to become and discover the person that I already was in him, which then led me to behave accordingly to who I already was. And that has been a really fun, process. Um, so that was a part of my invitation. Okay, so if we think about the guys, the fishermen, okay, they were Jews, and as Jewish boys, they were probably well learned in scripture, would you not say? To an extent, I mean, from my understanding, I'm not very, I'm not a theolo you know, very theologian, 
but from my understanding, Jewish boys are well versed in the Old Testament scripture. So, but let's kind of scrap that for a bit. And let's talk to someone who might not be so well versed. Because that's who I relate to. I don't relate very well to well versed people. I didn't grow up in the church. I really have a horrible short term memorizing memory. So I'm not very good with memorizing scripture, and I have a really, really hard time relating to something that I, I haven't experienced myself. So learning scripture that way is not um, very good for me. So I thought about the woman at the well, the Samarian woman, and how Jesus, of course, goes to the well and has this um, conversation with the woman. And if you go to John 4, that's where the story's at. Um, and again, I don't want to sit and just read scripture and we'll talk about some. But when I think about her and encountering, I mean, she didn't really know her, I mean, she knew enough about, um, about the Jewish culture. Um, she knew enough, I believe, about God, but had never encountered him, of course, for herself. But deep down within her, I think that's why Jesus continued to speak about um, living water. I think someone deep down inside of her, her spirit person, really was longing to be quenched and filled. So Jesus spoke directly to her in that context. But that encounter with Jesus led her, it says in verse 27, at this point his disciples came and they were amazed that they had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, why do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water part and went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out to the city and were coming to him. So just think for like a second. She encountered, she encountered Christ. She didn't just know of him. She didn't just know um, scripture and verse about him she encountered him and what I mean, what did that do for her I mean she got up immediately and goes to the men this woman goes to the men of the town and begins sharing and preaching pretty much what she had just encountered drastically changed her life enough that the men took her seriously you what and that the men enough took, that the yeah, men took came. her seriously yeah. and came so you got to wonder, like, how, how when someone has that type of encounter, how no one, you often hear, no one can take that away from you when you have that, you know, an encounter, um, because it's yours. So how the depth of how she shared must have been so persuasive and so strong. Like, it wasn't just a superficial sharing. It came out, I think, from the very depth of her. So I want that. That's what I've been looking at, like all those years in church, reading and trying to be and, and doing these good things. I wanted that depth with him, and I want that still. So let's look at, this is where I'm going to use the whiteboard. Okay, so what did Jesus come to earth to model or to do? Just a couple. So when we think about Jesus, atone for sin. Okay. And I'm not a very good cancer. What else? When you think of him, reveal his father. a supernatural lifestyle.
came to remove any anything that would keep people from the Father. So all of his arguments were with the religious elite. So he kind of challenged them? Challenged the religious? Yeah. Okay. He challenged a religious spirit that Like a religious system, that's what I have. Yeah, that makes it work? Yeah. He modeled a, like this is pre-cross, but modeled a righteous man, like what righteousness looked like, pre-cross. So that was something that we all try to do. What about um, discipleship and mentoring? Intercessor? felt that he really modeled um, what truth truly was and experience, like experiential truth. Um, and that's really where I want to go tonight. We're going to talk a lot about um, the difference with knowledge and the difference with experience. Um, because I think we have, I think you need both. But I think sometimes the, no, the knowledge and the experience and it's either really lopsided or really, really far apart. So we have one part of the church that is really living off of the knowledge of without really ever having an experience. And then we have a whole other side of the church that's just living off the experience without really the knowledge. Um, so that's kind of where we're going to go tonight. Diane had something you had said about the religious system, um, and I just want to talk about that a little bit. He was really hard on the religious leaders um, back at that time, and if you look at, to actually turn with me to Matthew 23, 13 through 29 list a lot of the woes that Jesus really talked about. Like he was, these are the verses where he was really, really harsh and hard on the religious leaders. But in verse 23, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. What he's really saying is these guys totally shut out and shut off heaven from people because they themselves had no experience of it whatsoever. None. And I just felt like as I was reading it, like that's, like Jesus took that very seriously. That they're teaching and teaching and teaching and holding all this stuff in such high regard and having never experienced them, this themselves. I learn best when I experience. 
I don't know how most of you do, but most of my experiences, there's been lots of really, really good ones, but I learned the very, very best from some of the worst mistakes that I've made. Because I think those experiences, that's where I can make a choice to really learn something from it. If I, you know, hopefully choose to do that. But, so I'm a very experiential person. So that's, I believe, why I had no doubt when I came to Christ at that retreat, when he called me and someone inside of me was like, he sees me. From that point on, I was a very experiential um, disciple with him. I didn't know him scripturally, but I started to know who he was relationally and more hands-on. Mm -hmm very supernaturally. Like I um, just remember being awakened to this person speaking to me. I remember um, praying for people, just feeling very led to pray with people. And I watched people be healed and not understand that. Um, led and just to a lot of encounters with people and realizing that that was Jesus in me wanting to reach out. And I had never experienced that before, but I think deep down I had such a longing for it because it was real and not the fakeness that I had seen for, for a very, very long time. So Jesus is really saying, like, um, you know, in mentoring in the disciples, Jesus was developing a church leader. If we talk about the kingdom of heaven, that would carry the kingdom of heaven in them. And that's really what he was mentoring and modeling while he was here. You know, praying, interceding, mm -hmm. healing, deliverance. I mean, that was all speaking to that person and having them, you know, the woman at the well, what's that deep need that lie underneath, speaking to the inner man and, and speaking to the heart. That was all very experiential. Definitely did not teach them the how to hold a meeting and run a church, did he? So it was a lot different than what we have now. And I think a lot about Acts 3. I think I sat in on Bible study and um, maybe Mark was talking about Peter and John. And you remember the beggar um, that sat outside for a long time? And it wasn't until they had passed and he reached out, of course, and he wanted wanted money and Peter says what I, I don't have but what I do have I give you and told him to stand and walk. He sat outside those temple gates all that time all those years and never once had an encounter with the Lord never once and that just breaks my heart of how many people are sitting in church and have never been taken by the hand and given an actual encounter you know how I think about that beggar like he was probably preached that all the time like with words you know one of the first things that I um, have been noticing when I'm talking to someone if they start giving me you know a lot of scripture and all that stuff right away I think someone like my spirit man just kind of closes up because I do you know what I mean like I, I don't want words thrown at me I want life I want him and I just don't want knowledge I want an encounter and I think we're starting to really see the difference and the people out there want to see a difference of the genuineness and not just the responses that they think that we should have I mean they're really beggars sitting at this you know at the, the gates just waiting for that encounter mm -hmm. and we are the way that we have that encounter So I told you that I think that knowledge needs to be accompanied by an experience. Okay. So in John 8.32 it says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So when I think about truth, and if truth really genuinely makes me free, I try to think about what that truth is, which often leads me back to scripture. Okay. I'm going to be very honest. Um, about a year and a half ago, I stopped reading. 
I was really walking through a lot of um, just a lot of intimate encounters with the Lord where he was really revealing a lot of what was happening within my heart and something inside of me kind of shifted where it wasn't I started to make this simple relationship of just walking with him talking with him getting to know him him getting to know me in a way that I could relate I started to make it a lot about what I was doing. Um, I became a part of a church plant, and I started to do a lot of religious church type of things, um, because I really thought that was what I was to do. So something shifted within myself, and I started pursuing him in a very um, way that wasn't simple. My relationship with him started getting very complicated. So I noticed I started to have kind of less and less encounters with him. And I wasn't just always out seeking an encounter to have some type of supernatural encounter. I was really, but there was an element of him that I began to miss, that I realized was missing. And I think a lot of it was because I started to take, um, I started to try to, to learn about him instead of just trying to relate and get to know him. I think there's a difference where I would began to become more concerned with his functions than I was with our relationship. So I stopped reading through scripture about um, a year and a half ago, and I still, you know, read and did other things, but I just really kind of got out of the word. Because to me, the word really began to represent, and that's what I thought it was, the word. Like, I needed to do something when I was there, and I started becoming frustrated mm -hmm. when I was reading it. Um, it just felt like there was some type of expectation. It's really hard to explain, so I just kind of stopped. And I began to feel, after a couple months, at first it was very freeing, and then after a couple months I started to feel kind of really bad. That here I am, and I'm not even reading the Word of God. Mm -hmm. and. Until here, within the last um, six or so months, really realizing that scripture is just scripture. That the word of God is the word of God, the person of Jesus. I, that's not what I was taught. And for me, it was really freeing to know that I could go and I can sit and read about him and read but that it never ever should have trumped my relational, my relationship with him, my my day-to-day -day walking with him. That it was a guide and not God himself. And I'm not, I've never said that out loud before, but it just really was an eye-opener to me because I realized I started, I was trying to teach my children that and I was trying to um, and the people that I was walking alongside with was really, I was shifting the relationship end and was making a lot about um, the knowledge end. So um, I'm very thankful that that has changed and that I feel like I'm taking things back down notches to make just things a little simpler. Mm -hmm. I think that's who he is. share with you a little bit. When I went to Hershey Park a couple weeks ago, I had um, a woman at a park bench. And this is, this is what really made me think about the simplicity of Jesus. I had a woman on a park, park bench come and sit down beside me. And we really started to just sit and chat. And for some reason, um, and I just have to believe it was from the Lord, we started to chat about um, our, our beliefs. And she started to ask me a lot of questions about what I believed in, where I went to church, um, doctrine, and I mean, just lots of stuff. And I'll be very honest, a lot of it was just really 
over my head because um, I don't understand a lot of things like pillars and salt and fires and flame. Revelation scares me because I don't know a lot of it. <laughs> so, it makes great movies. Exactly. <laughs> But that conversation, as I was talking to her, I just really felt like Jesus said, you just need, why are you in this relationship with me? And all I can think about was, for love. For love. Like, so all I could go back to her was, I love the father. I am his daughter. And this is all just, you know, verbatim of what I share, but essentially, like, I have a personal relationship with Jesus led by the Holy Spirit. And it just made me think about in Matthew 22, 36, 40, where it says, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. One of these two commandments depend the whole law of the prophets, the law and the prophets. So I shared that with her, not you know, in context like that, but to share that with her that this is what I feel like, I love the Lord. And if all I ever know is that I love him despite my understanding, despite the knowledge that I have of him, but if I could just remember when he called me to him and that someone on the inside realized that despite whatever imperfections she had, no matter what it is that she's done, that someone sees her, that someone's pursuing her, that someone's not requiring anything of her. It's kind of like for those of you who've had a baby or a child, you just instantly love. It's love you can't manufacture, you can't get your gear yourself up to love. It's that instant type of love. I have that love for him and I don't understand it and I can't fully explain it I don't have um, I don't know what version of the Bible sometimes I read out of and what doctrine I follow and so you know all that crazy stuff that we make it about but I do know that if I keep Jesus simple if I keep it simple to the fact that he loves me I love him. Then I can go on to this next part of shall love your neighbor as yourself. And really that's all I need to know. I mean, I am enjoying learning and understanding more of his nature and who he is, who I am in that. I mean, I believe there's a lot of value in continuing to learn that. But some of that gets to the point, at least for someone like me, where it gets so big that it almost starts shutting down someone inside of me mm. that just longs for a, a relationship. And, you know, I remember when I first came to know the Lord, I said to a friend of mine that, because I think a lot in church we're taught that we don't have, we shouldn't take a lot of value in loving ourselves. For some reason, it's always about serving other people, doing for other people, love God, do for other people. But I remember reading to him and saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And thinking, I have a lot of importance and a lot of um, value. And in that time, I didn't realize how much I had. But realized that if I don't learn to love this person here and see her the way that he sees her, how will I ever really begin to convey that to other people? And that has been a real process. We talk mm. about the flesh and the inner man, that flesh burning off, to really reveal that person underneath has been a really long and harsh sometimes process, but it's been really beautiful because in the midst of finding out who I am, then I can truly um, allow Jesus in me to reach out and encounter people that I come in contact with. And in 
and not try to make it something bigger than it's supposed to be. Like the woman in Hershey Park sitting on the park bench, just talking and you know reaching out. I mean, we are called. We talked about the you know what Jesus. Why did he come? He came and he modeled heaven on earth. I mean, we are called to be and to not just get into works of doing, but it's got to look like something, right? I mean, it's got to look something other than just coming on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. So this encounter that we're having has to, at some point, start looking like someone outside of what we're doing right here. So if we're not carrying him and allowing him to reach out, I have really big questions about what it is that we're doing. Are we doing it from up here? Or are we doing it because like the woman at the well, she had such a powerful encounter. She was so persuasive to the men in the village because it was undeniable. You know, are we living like that? I often think a lot of times, like especially, I, I'm an extrovert. I love to talk to people. And I embarrass my children all the time. If you're friends with me on Facebook, I write some of the crazy stuff that we do. It's just, I love, I'm learning because of him, not because some scripture has told me that this is the greatest commandment, because I want to know him. I'm tired of walking around with this relationship and not having it look like someone. It needs to look and smell like Jesus. If I'm really saying that, yes, you have not just my okay, mm -hmm. but you have my yes, it needs to. So when I'm out, there's a lot of times where I just have to get over myself, whether it's at Walmart or the grocery store or the bank, whether it is just to smile to someone or something, it has to look like someone. And let me just tell you the story. This was years ago. I was at Walmart, and my um, I was in line, and I was putting all my um, stuff on the checkout counter. And my checkout woman was just going through and just doing her job. And I really just felt like the Lord told me that I needed to give her a hug. And I stood in line. The whole pile of groceries that I was doing was really arguing. I, you want me to give a woman a hug that I've never even, I don't even know her. Like that's just freaky and weird. But I get up to the checkout counter after all my food's up and I'm getting ready to pay and I just looked at her and I said, I know that you don't know me, but I really feel like I'm just supposed to give you a hug. Well, let me just tell you, this woman barreled around the corner of the Walmart cashier and hugged me and began to cry. And here what had happened is she had just left her husband. Her name is Maria. And he had abused her for like 20 some years. And she had just left him. And all she needed was a tangible hug. And I didn't say, the Lord's telling me to give you a hug. I just told her, I feel like I'm supposed to give you a hug. But every time I go to Walmart now and I see Maria, I don't have to approach her anymore at all. She comes to me. And I know that I know it's because she had an encounter with mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah. I have. You know, and sometimes in following him and trying not to just know him, but encounter him, we have to get over ourselves. We have to um, learn to think that sometimes we're crazy. Because I know a lot of times over the course of my eight-year relationship with him, I often think if I was to tell some people some of the stuff, they think I have a really um, imagination, like a really crazy imagination, because my mom has said that before when I talked with her a lot about my relationship with Jesus. You. You're just very creative. And I think, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like when you have, just to, to filter through, I could have sat there at the grocery store at Walmart, and I could have sat back, and I could have argued and thought, that's not the Lord at all. But I'm learning that I would so rather be wrong. And so what if? What if I go out on limb and what if I'm wrong? But what if, but what if he's right? And what if I'm wrong, so what? But just those things like that really make me 
want to kind of step out more and more where um, whether it's and I think sometimes we just feel really uncomfortable and we think our faith is in this relationship is one it's just for us as long as I'm growing as long as I'm changing as long as it's nice that it's seeping out now into my family it's really nice that I'm becoming a better mom I'm being a better friend it's really really great that it's changing my husband and I's marriage. That's really, really great. Okay. Um, yes, I sat the other night with a friend for a couple hours and she cried and I listened and we prayed. That was really, really nice. But what if there's times when it's supposed to, or it should go outside of the context of where we're comfortable? Where are we at with that? really, really, where are we at with reaching out and being not just like Christ, but really just allowing the person of the Lord within us to do what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. I really think, this is the stuff that gets me excited. You know, sitting back and trying to show earlier, it's just not, this is what, talk, like, talking about the person of the Lord and how he just wants to to breathe in and out of our interweaving of everything that we do. Every experience that we have, he wants to be a part of it. Every experience that we have. So when we think of it that way, what are some of the things, like just share, like what are some of the things that hold you back from experiencing him in that way? Outside of those close-knit relationships outside of your own personal time with him and your own personal relationship. What are some of the things that hold you back from allowing him just to kind of ooze out and onto other people that you don't know? Does anyone else feel comfortable and get excited about doing that type of thing? I mean, I always feel like relationship actually gives me the floor to speak into people's lives. So when the relationship isn't there, the Lord will, will give me instruction as far as speaking to perfect strangers, and sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Because when the relationship isn't there, I don't feel like I have the floor. And that actually holds me back. A okay. lot of impact. Okay. So you feel like when you have a relationship with someone, well, you feel like you, one, feel more comfortable? But two, you feel like that brings like validity to what you're going to share. And in, in, in by saying relationship, even in um, knowing someone's name, uh, maybe I'll have an encounter with them. I'll tell them I like their shoes, and I'll ask them their name. I find out their name, and I know that I'll see them the next week. And going back to them, I feel like I have an in because they know my name and I know theirs. So relationally, there's already an introduction that's been done. Those types of things give me the courage to go back again. And um, I don't know, it makes me feel like I have the floor. And that if the Lord gave me something very specific, I feel then that I, I have the ability to just go for it. That makes sense. I think, um, so like a, a few weeks ago, it was getting ready to rain, and I was on 995. I passed the lady. She was going my direction, but I don't live far off of 995 and 30. And so as soon as I went by her, she was kind of going fast, and I'm thinking, she's probably trying to beat the rain. I should probably stop. But I still hadn't been home yet, and it was like 7 o'clock, and I wanted to get home. So then I heard again, you should turn around and see if she needs a ride. So I did. And there was a part of me, though, that was saying, like, what if she wants to go to Mercersburg? Or what if she wants to go to Greek? Like, I, I am only a half a mile away, and I want to get home. So part of, part of my thing. So I stopped, and I offered, and she, like, looked at me like I had three heads. And she's like, no, I'm okay. She's like, why did you stop? I said, well, I don't want to sound crazy, but I, I felt like I was supposed to offer you a ride. She's like, are you a Christian? I'm like... Yeah, I'm a believer. She's like, okay, thanks. And then, wouldn't you know it, I go down, I turn back around, somebody else stops, and she gets in their car and goes. And, um, and, and 
I was cool with that because the Lord said to me, um, and I'm like getting off top topic here, but that stop was for me, not for her. Right. Mm -hmm. um, now, back to that point though, where I was resistant, I was, I didn't, like part of me is afraid to say, oh my gosh, what if they, what if they need more than what I'm able to give or, 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 or what I'm willing to give. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I don't, that, that probably scares me more than anything else. So. That's a real, yeah. I wouldn't have said that. I wouldn't have noticed that, but you saying that, I know that I, from time to time, I'll, I'll be concerned they want more than I can sustain. Yeah. I, I, you know. The other thing is, I, personality, I detest being interrupted. I detest it. Um, and I have young ones out with me all the time. And so I will occasionally see people I know that I am supposed to say something. Or I know the Lord's talking to me and I can't even get 30 seconds to myself to like switch gears enough to, to hear what he's saying. Like, And that to me is more frustrating. I will often get in the car and just be like, man. Just because I could not switch over like I know that I should have been able to. And that, I'm not usually scared to talk to people. I'm, I just, I hate having my young ones there and being concerned that they're ripping the store apart or <laughs> breaking something or even interrupting that person and trying to tell, Allie wants to tell everybody about her newest awesome thing. And um, I just avoid it entirely <laughs> for that reason. I don't usually avoid talking to people. I just a lot of times won't follow through with what I heard the Lord say to say. Um, sometimes it's that. I'll have the conversation because I love talking to people. I can talk to them about anything. But when it comes to what I'm hearing the Lord say, especially with something so personal, I question, do I have the right to say that? Is it okay to say that? I think for me, a lot of times, it's that I don't want what the Lord is telling me to say to someone. I don't want them to interpret it from me wrong. Like, I'm afraid that I'm not going to say it right. And then, like, what he's trying to say to them, they don't understand what I'm saying. Like, they'll misunderstand my heart or where it's coming from. So you take too much responsibility? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's... Okay, what were they again? So we had Aaron. What would you say? Just categorize yours real quick. You. you they asked too much of you. Yes. Okay. That doesn't sound selfish. No, it's real. <laughs> we all know you. You're not selfish. Okay. Um. <laughs> Diane, what was yours? Just sum it up. It would be interruptions and can't. Or haven't yet developed the ability to be both a mother and spiritual at the same time. Oh my gosh, interruptions. My hard. attention span, maybe. <laughs> That's right. Okay, I told you I have horrible handwriting. Okay, and yours was just. Um, you don't want to be misinterpreted. Yeah. Misunderstood. Getting it wrong. Goes halfway. <laughs> <laughs> you do connect. That's um, what follow through. I'm afraid that I don't have the right. Mm. Okay. Boundary. Just lick the board. <laughs> <laughs> I have Sorry. painter over here. For just, now. just roll with it. I know. You tell the mom. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Nobody said rejection. That's good. I would have said that one. <laughs> you would have said that one? that one? Yeah. Okay. Can you give us experience? Like, can you give us like some type of experience? Yeah, and I can't say that I've ever had that experience. So that's just, just a, a fear. fear of like, oh, they're gonna just not receive anything that's coming. From. But that's never been my experience when I have said that. Yeah. Before. But it's still it's right. Fear of it. Is a fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. fear. Anybody else want to put one up there? Maybe it's not for you personally, but 
It's a legitimate fear that you have? I don't know if you can put mine up here, because I think both of these ladies already said it. Okay. Which, the clone and the bag will be right there. Her and the wonder and the behind the hand. Because they both said that the combination, mine's kind of like a combination of both of theirs. Okay. It's, I mean, I suppose, because I'm thinking like, you know, I always run into people who you don't know what they're going to get. It's just you don't know how they're going to react. And I think that falls right over there. Or whatever it says. Yeah. <laughs> I can't see it from here. Mm -hmm. but it's just that you don't know if they're going to like, just jump and be all like, defensive with it. And, you know, just get out of them or from them. From them. Okay. But then it's like, uh, I can kind of see the... Uh, Because I can see what she was saying on that tail, and I was just thinking, talking about those girls, so I don't know what I'm thinking. I'm just like, because that's, uh, that's what I was thinking of how that has been, or how I've seen it, you know. Right. And I'm just kind of like, well, <laughs> I don't think I can. Yeah, I mean, very legitimate reasons. Because, one, a lot of them have, like, emotions attached to them, and, I mean, we can sit back all day and be like, but it's Jesus in me that wants to, but we are the ones who have to be willing to kind of step out and risk. Because extending, you know, being an extension is being a risk. Because, I mean, if you think about it, we all have um, triggers with inside of us. Like Dawn, as soon as you said rejection, I mean, that's been, I think, one of my roots all my life was just rejection and how easy even like on you know a really good day how that can just kind of get pricked a little bit and it can kind of make you want to hold back up and not put yourself back out there um, so do you can you honestly say like and be real like do you have a legitimate desire to reach out beyond your comfort zone, like legitimately, because some people really don't, and I'm not saying one way or the other, but I'm just asking, like legitimately, do you have a desire to reach outside? So you guys are all like shaking. I was just thinking we all had a reason. So even by having the reason, we're all acknowledging that we heard the call or the right. tug. Right. Okay. So what if sometimes we think that the stepping out needs to be bigger than what it really should be? Do you know what I mean? Sometimes we think this um, extension, like you were saying, it needs to be, you know, like what if they ask too much? What if they not only ask too much, but what if the Lord himself asks too much more than what I'm willing to give? Mm -hmm. Right? And, and I think sometimes he will. Right. Yeah. Oftentimes. But that's how I think that's, that's how usually grow. how. Right. <laughs> not doing it. Right. What we're comfortable doing all the time. But I've, I have found that, the, of course, he's always looking at, you know, the heart and really what your motives are for pursuing because I don't want to just go out and try to talk to people and reach out to people so I could say that I talked and reached out to people, right? right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to do that. But on the other hand, I don't want to complicate him just wanting to reach someone. So I'm, I'm learning that even a smile, even the smaller things are a way of ex an extension of him which then just kind of can allow me to kind of step out a little bit more. Because I think that's a process as well. It's not all of us want to turn our vehicles around and go back and talk to someone and offer or, or give them a word. I mean, when you get to the point where you're, you know, you're wanting to give someone what you feel like the Lord's saying to them, that's a big risk. I can understand that. I think it's hard for me because I see things so specifically. How the Lord speaks to me on a seer very prophetic so sometimes I see things about their lives that are very personal so when I hear that when I see that I might want to speak over it but going back to having the right to saying it if 
I see something about someone's marriage to go up to a complete stranger and start speaking to them about their marriage, that could blow up in my face very badly. So there's so much discernment that has to be carried in that conversation. It has to be timely. And maybe I'm supposed to hear it, and maybe I'll encounter that person again later. Maybe the Lord will show me more. I don't know. So going up to them and just having a casual conversation is a good starting point for me to know, is this the best time to talk about this thing? It's hard to know. I just saw into you conversations we've had recently. <laughs> You've been testing the waters with me. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> All of those, I think that we all have places where we test the waters to see if we can go further. Right. But I think we all have the desire to. So how can we make, how can we go from the point of breaking through some of those? I mean, what, what is it for you where you, is this just acknowledgement that it's there? Acknowledgement that I feel they might ask too much? Acknowledgement that I fear rejection. Acknowledgement that I might be misunderstood. But is there a point where you make a choice to push past that and to do it anyway? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Because some don't ever make that choice to push past that point. I mean, really, they, we have a whole church that's doing that. You know, a lot of people don't make that choice to go past themselves because it's really ourselves that we stop or we stop ourselves so but I think that I think the most I think the most I want to say the word accurate but I don't think that's right but you built you built this coming out of loving your neighbor and I think that sometimes we are just so unaware of the ones on the fringes and the marginalized and their pain. Because I think if, if the Lord gives us a revelation of that person's brokenness and their pain and their need, um, we're so much more likely to respond to that um, and be less aware of our, of our holdups. I've just, I've just found that I have a lot of stuff to get rid of in that. And one of the things has been asking the Lord to, sh to wake up compassion in me because I can tend to be very cut and dry, black and white, just hard. And But as he wakes up compassion, sometimes I'll walk past people and I haven't yet talked to them, but I will walk around the corner and just my heart will break. Like So I think that for me that the process has had to become one of softening even to the pain of others and to become aware of how sincerely broken so many are and hungry and seeking because when I come at it from that place and that part of me is, is, is healthy then I don't care what it costs me anymore I, I want I want to you know Whatever I can be, I want to be that. So like for the Samaritan woman, like he, her experience of Jews is that pretty arrogant people. And like, <laughs> whoa, this, like this Jew just spoke to me. It spoke to me in a way that, look, number one, yeah. spoke to me. Yeah. <laughs> acknowledged, right. Jesus acknowledged her. And, and, and that built her up so much so that she could go and share Jesus. And just acknowledging somebody, like you said, mm -hmm. it, it brings value to them. Mm -hmm. and that's not from us. Right. I don't think we give them the value. I guess sometimes I maybe could, or it could be perceived that way, but when we do it, especially with a stranger, when we do it, that's, I think that's Christ they don't know us from anybody. A stranger doesn't know us from anybody. Right. All right? And we give them value. Or Christ gives them value to us. Well, Autumn, I'm thinking about you with this, the, the Samaritan woman. Okay, so you talk about seeing and 
wanting to speak. That's what Jesus did to her. He saw and he spoke directly, but he also spoke directly to the deep need. You know, why did she have five husbands and was living with one that she wasn't married? So he not only acknowledged it, but he went directly to her heart, the heart issue, which that is what the encounter of Jesus does different than the knowledge of Jesus. He takes it directly, and that's what he did all through scripture, was he took the law and he revealed what was underneath. So that's what we are called to do too. You know, the fullness of heaven on earth through us, the kingdom in us, to reveal the heart, you know, so much to the point that if it's done genuinely and your motives are good, you know, what happens after that, and I know you know that, it's, it's truly up to the Lord, but what if you're choosing not to? Do you know what I mean? Like, I just think about that woman. What if he had not chosen to stop mm -hmm. and to speak directly to that um, I've had I've had a lot of experiences of speaking to people, but I think one of the things that gets in my way too is I'm usually in public, you know, with a crowd of people, and I see someone the Lord starts speaking to me about, and I I probably allow too much of the natural to get in the way of the spiritual, because when the Lord starts speaking to me about someone and I start seeing their stuff and I have the ability to speak to it, I start thinking we're in the middle of the store, and if I start talking about this, she's probably going to start weeping. I don't want to do that to her. You know, I, I am moved by compassion, but I allow my compassion, my humanity, to actually get in the way of the Lord sometimes. Right. That's the truth of it. I think a lot of times we walk around, I don't want to call it like double-minded, but kind of where we have to, That's true. we're walking in the natural, and now I got a sudden I got to flip to the spirit, the, the spiritual. Or I've got to flip I'm acting this way, I'm in mummy mode, now I gotta flip to spiritual mode. Because that's just the reality that I think just the nature of us being people and humans, we got life and stuff. So how can we practice walking more where we don't have to so easily flip it? Where we don't have to sit back and try to, I gotta shift gears. Where we're walking in it so much where it kind of can over, it kind of can flow out effortlessly, so we don't have to try to accommodate the change happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Anybody have any thoughts on that? No, I just told somebody that the other day. My children will be how I learn to do that. Because if I can, if I can be a spiritual person as a mother, I mean that's that's it. <laughs> <laughs> you can change a diaper and see Jesus. You are doing. <laughs> there is no higher place, I don't think. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like I think because I will have to coexist, like like Jesus did. Like he he was that. I want. I will. I will learn that. It's just taking. Right. I think it begins with just wanting to be there. Yeah. I think that's where I was getting after I took that year and a half of just like, I need, this is too much. Like, I am overcomplicating this. I'm making this about me and what I'm doing and not doing. Like, it started to come a lot about self-preservation and not intimacy the way that I knew intimacy was available with the Lord. And I did, I got tired of switching from walking in the spirit to walking in the natural, because I know what it tasted like to walk in the spirit. We all know what it tastes like to walk in the spirit. And I mean, it's it's not just all, you, you know, it's not all, it, there's stuff, There's it's hard stuff sometimes. But we know what it tastes like. We know who's there. So I think, I think that's probably a process and a journey of our hearts for all of us just to want to be in a place where we're willing to give up our natural, we're willing to give up mm -hmm. us, essentially, to walk more in that realm. And I'm sure what that looks like for each of us is going to be a lot different. There's not a process that's like A, B, and C, but I think it starts with, you know, 
our heart and where we're at. Like, do we really, really, how serious are we? Are we willing to, when he calls us, that we immediately, like immediately, like I think about those men. They left everything. Like mm -hmm. family, ch children, homes, parents, the future, money, mm -hmm. uh, kids at Walmart. Like I just think about that sometime. Like, what am I willing to risk? Mm -hmm. And I'll be very honest, the last couple months, the cost has been pretty severe for me to follow Jesus. It's it's mm -hmm. costing friendships, it's costing family. And but it's because I want to walk in the spirit more than I want to preserve myself in the natural. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the process, and there's lots of days where I just forget it all. I'm going to take everything back. But that process of, no, when you call my name, when you call me today, wherever that is, I am going to say yes, and I'm going to come immediately. I'm going to speak immediately. I'll hug immediately. I'll pull over immediately. I will, whatever it is, immediately. everybody to want that because I really really want that because I'm really really tired of living in that other place and I, that's just the very simple nature of the person of the Lord about it, the 
Bible is highly debatable all the time. Churches get torn apart, families get torn apart, nations get torn apart all over um, interpreting scripture because it's held in such high, it's very needed, but it's held in almost as a God itself. Right? And how complicated we make it from that context. It was never, ever intended to do that. There's a uh... So like 2 Timothy 2.14, remind them of these things, yada, 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 uh, do not wrangle about words, you know, and, uh, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. So that to me is like doctrine. Mm -hmm. Like, let's, let's, I don't want to argue with you about whether there's a rapture or there's not a rapture because quite honestly, we're, we're both interpreting something different. Like, so, so why even bother that? And why let that come between us? Right. And it all comes from the Word of God. <laughs> the Bible. Right. It does, though, speak to the underlying DNA in every single person that so wants an encounter with their spirit is unable to understand how to get there, at least in the natural, they have this, like, I'm just thinking about, like, I, I am the result of generations and generations and generations and generations of devout believers. Yeah. None of them have encountered the spirit like I am beginning to. None of them have. And yet, their faithfulness is why I'm here. So, well, I assume. I don't know what the Lord would have done to get a hold of me. He would have found me some way. But they, even they, like my grandma, she knew Jesus. She didn't understand a lot of the things that I've been taught now. But her her Bible is falling apart. She's gone now. Yeah. But there's notes in ever like, I mean, it's just like this. Like, you have to treat it with TLC if you're going to move it. It's two hands. Like, now the binding no longer works. And um, so even even them, though, they, they couldn't come into this dynamic experience of the person of Jesus. Like, like I wake up wanting. They were hungry. They were hungry for it, too. That's just how they knew to, 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 to do that, you know. And so I... To me, it just reestablishes that in every person is this burning yeah. ache to and be with him. Why we're so important? Like that's why we're, we have such an important role mm -hmm. to take someone and lead them into an encounter. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Lord, I think He's obviously quite capable of that all by Himself, but He chose us to partner with Him. So when we, for those of us who are walking like that, mm -hmm. with him, we have responsibility to, and I don't want to say responsibility in a sense where I got to go out, you know, but it's, if we are hosting his presence, you know, we, if we're doing him, I always think, I don't beat myself up anymore, but those times where I feel that prompting, and I choose not to because it's probably more times that I don't than what I actually do. And I'm learning just to let it go and ask for another opportunity. But I, lately I'm like, you know, I, it's not about me. So I make it now like I really, I didn't give you that opportunity for I'm really sorry. Because I just think it's just about him. So every time I think about that time that I want to reach out and I have that fear for whatever reason. I don't know enough. I'm going to look stupid. I'll be rejected. I don't have time. This is you know, bothering me. I try to put myself, the Lord wants to reach them. This has nothing at all to do with me. What if this one thing, this one small thing, what if that embrace to Maria, who just was sitting there scanning groceries, 
scanning groceries, taking money, and in her heart she was like dying, probably beating herself up and going through all this stuff. What if that hug just gave her hope, it gave her encouragement that nothing about what she did, but just about just like the embrace of the Father and who she is. What if that was just enough to start something, you know? I don't want to get in the way.